This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Isotope, Atom Audio, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z V12 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D mic pre and C610 complimenter with Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. Please remember to check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes. It's a great way to help support this show. Now get ready to rock. And just like if I was in the business of manufacturing, let's say, a mechanical pencil, well, I would go out into the market, buy every mechanical pencil, tear it apart, find out what was good and bad about each one, and make sure that mine had all the good components and could compete. That analogy is exactly the same and is valid for the music business. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Psst. Hey, rock stars, over here. I've got a secret to tell you about how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars. My secret is using Isotope RX Ozone and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, D-S, D-Plosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limited, all from Isotope. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the secret code ROCK10 and get 10% off any plug-in purchase from Isotope. You can tell your friends, but, you know, be cool about it. My recording studio is proudly powered by OWC, and I love how it's improved and sped up my workflow. OWC can connect all your audio work drives, trackballs, mix controllers, MIDI keyboards, audio interfaces, displays, or cameras so that you can work fast and focus on making your best record ever. Go check out the Mini Stack STX, Thunder Bay 4, or Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars to find the perfect solution for your studio from OWC. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lidge Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is John Mayfield a mastering engineer with over 50 years of experience and owner of Mayfield Mastering in Berry Hill. Originally a career musician, John turned to recording and mixing in the 1980s, traveling to studios all over the world. He's also been a guest previously on episode RSR 36, so check that out if you'd like to hear more about his backstory. Originally, as a successful touring and studio musician, John started out in the studio recording and mixing and finally settled in Nashville to start his own mastering studio. He's worked with many artists, including the Dave Matthews Band, Sarah Evans, Kathy Matea, Naturally 7, Warner Brothers Records, and Universal Music Group UK, to list just a few. John also notes on his website that everybody in music is trying to figure out what is next and define a new business model. Since records are being made more often by independent sources with smaller budgets that cannot always afford the high dollar mixer, the need for quality mastering is very much in demand. Quote, music will always be a part of our lives. Maintaining and improving the quality of that music has always been at the heart of my efforts. It's not a job to me, but rather a true joy. You would be amazed at what we can do with a project in mastering that might not have been an A-plus mix. So that's a quote from John, um, which I think is a great topic for us to talk about because we're often curious about how the intersection is between working with a professional mastering engineer and what we're able to do in our home studios as well. So please welcome John Mayfield 
back to recording Studio Rockstars. John, are you ready to rock again, my friend? Absolutely. Let's do it. Glad to have you back, man. Um, it's been it's been a few years. You were one of the first early guests I had on the show. I remember coming to your studio in Berry Hill. We set up in your control room, which was a beautiful space. Um, tell us a little bit about what's uh, what's going on over at your studio. I imagine some things may have changed since then, or maybe you had it all dialed in and nothing's really changed as far as the look of the space. Well, uh, I think it was after you came the first time we uh, made an investment into um, a uh, flagship uh, PMC monitoring system. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I the joke is I decided not to buy myself a nice Mercedes, but to put that same <laughs> amount of money in into the modern system. And it has made a huge difference. Um, although the footprint of the speaker system itself was exactly the same, the uh, technology behind the amplification and uh, the speakers it's themselves has changed and uh, PMC has just done an incredible job of marrying the amplifier to the speaker. Um, they are now making their own amps and uh, they are just the combination of the amp and the speaker marriage is just beautiful. So yeah, I'm very happy about it. That's groovy. Yeah. I, th I believe PMC has an office right there in Berry Hill. I remember going to um, visit their place. They do. At a at one of the uh, the Na summer Nam parties years ago, exactly. Um, and then when I look at it, I, I remember seeing that, spotting that on your website. Now they have the big woofers that almost looks like it has like a protective grill front, like a like a um, <laughs> like an off roading truck, you know? <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Does that does that make them sound better for mastering anything that might be in in the country genre of music? No, no, they <laughs> they are just uh, perfect for all styles. Uh, yeah, honestly. Um, well, so let's see. So that didn't really change the footprint. Did that? What What does it mean for you as a mastering engineer with that design for your studio? When you put those speakers in there, what are some of the things that have to happen next? Before, I mean, do you just do you just like plunk a couple of speakers down, plug them in and say, let's go to mastering. Or do you actually have to do some process where you tune them or line them up or, or align them in some way? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, when we uh, took delivery on the whole system, uh, Maurice Pastis from PMC came in and we spent about five days simply working on positioning, the wow. actual position of the speaker system um you would be amazed at what six inches this way or that can do as a matter of fact there was um there was a null in my room a very finite null uh, a couple hertz either side of the center frequency i don't know i think it was around 90 hertz and it was um uh it's sort of irritating but i knew exactly where in the room it occurred and uh, if there was any question about a, a note at that particular frequency, I could move my head and whatever. Anyway, by positioning the speakers and working with that, um, we eliminated it. And wow. it, it, uh, it, the stereo image uh, just opened up and Maurice just sat here and worked for days and days trying to find the quote unquote sweet spot. And, uh, he found it. And of course, there is a very slight amount of DSP within the system mm -hmm. to, uh, and very, very slight, just to correct for oh, sweetness, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, after about the sixth day, um, uh, he <clears throat> left and I sat down and listened for about five days myself just to get comfortable and get to the point where I knew exactly what I was listening to because you can't wow. make you can't make accurate decisions unless you know exactly what the speakers inside the room are telling you and honestly there's a huge factor involved with the marriage of the speaker to the room mm -hmm. because because the room affects the speaker dramatically 
So this room uh, was purpose built, and it's a it, it's a big room, and required a big system. And uh, he finally got it married, <laughs> and uh, it's just when I sit down and make decisions, I don't question whether there's enough bass here or enough of this or that. I know exactly that those speakers are telling me what I need to hear. And based on that, I make my decision. Um, it's a very expensive process to get to that point, though. Huh, really? I like the oh. fact that you you make decisions about the bass based on your speakers. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's amazing. So five days of really just moving them around. Now, that's not because it takes f somebody five days to move six inches. <laughs> it's because you, you move it a little bit and you listen and listen and listen and then move it a little bit. So one of the questions that comes to mind for me is like, how do you even tabulate what the hell you think about it after, you, you know, across five days? I have trouble remembering what I think about, you know, two different things in five minutes sometimes. Yeah, you're right. And, uh, you know, it's it's all about um, uh, the aesthetic that you have built inside. What you think sounds good. Now, that mm -hmm. is, is a, an extremely broad and gray area. But based on what you think good is, sounds good is going to determine <clears throat> your success. You know, so uh, I, I sat down with uh, a number of of uh, CDs that I had grown up with and knew knew well, and I knew that they sounded really good uh, wherever you you uh, played them. Uh, work that I was very familiar with, and uh, I just sat down and listened and thought, you know what, I had to change my value structure ever so slightly. Because the resolution in this room is extreme. Mm -hmm. You can, I started hearing things that, frankly, I'd never heard before. Wow. Uh, way up on the top end and the tightness of the bottom end. And during those five days of listening, I sort of reformulated my own value structure. And it has served itself since. Is one of those values I like hanging out and just listening for five days and I don't feel like working anymore. <laughs> well, I'll I know tell that you, feeling. <laughs> I, I do love working in this room. I never get fatigued. It's a joy to work in. And uh, although I will say that when I go home, I don't listen to music. I've right. enough. You've been doing that all day. Enough already, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, as I've gotten older, I realized, wow, talk radio actually is more interesting than music <laughs> in the car sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, so now what about, um, what about level of listening? You know, when you don't get fatigued, is that, um, does that, how does that apply to how loud you listen? And do you find that turning the speakers up and turning them down is part of your process? We probably talked about this some before as well. Yeah, but it, 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 it's, it bears, uh, going back over because, um, when I'm working, depending on the genre, of course, and it's very genre specific, but mm -hmm. when I'm working, I think I average somewhere around 85 mm -hmm. dB. Um, and I've but, heard that number before as an example, mm -hmm. um, like if not to butcher the science, but that might have some correlation to a good middle point for the Fletcher Munson curve or something like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, but I will say that when, once I've established the curve that I want for a particular, uh, song and I'm ready to, to burn it, I burn it in real time as everybody should. Um, but I'll drop my monitors by 10 dB. All right. So that gets into the Fletcher Munson curve, of course, and it, will allow me sometimes to hear little little tiny ticks and or pops that I didn't hear when things were a bit louder. Mm -hmm. So that level difference, it's it, you're just listening to the to the file with a different perspective and you end up hearing things that, hmm, you know, I don't like that. 
stop, <laughs> go back, fix. Uh, so it's always good to listen to your masters at two different levels or even three. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, I do. I turn stuff down and listen that way in the studio, and I'm I'm struck. You know, I'm not I'm not doing it for mastering purposes, but I'm struck by things that become easy to hear at a low volume. Um, things like noticing the vocal performance in a way mm-hmm. that I didn't notice, mm-hmm. noticing yeah. tuning, you know, and then of course there's just that idea that you can hear the balances of instruments in a new way because you're, you're really probably focusing on, well, I know on my, in my studio, if I'm down on the, on the, the small Avantone, which is like the Oratone speaker, I'm noticing the mid range balances. Does that, do you feel like when you're listening at the lower level, you're hearing a little more of the mid range balance or is it still pretty full range? Cause you've got your big studio there. Yeah. Well, uh, there is a bit more, Mid range because there's a little bit less bass and a little bit less top end, and I think mm-hmm. that's based on the Fletcher Munson curve, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, not because of the performance or resolution of the speakers, but because of our natural Fletcher Munson uh, curve uh, loss that is, you know, normal for us humans. Yeah, we tend, yeah, we tend to lose a little response down on the bottom end and on the top end with volume. Uh, and so the mids come up, and that's where I start hearing little uh, issues that I didn't hear because I was hearing more bass and, and top. It's all a relative thing. Yeah, yeah. So rock stars, just to reiterate that one more time, our our human ear naturally at a louder volume registers more of the bass and more of the treble, and so we hear more more bass and treble, and at a lower volume our ear kind of lets go of that. I wonder why that is. I guess I guess it just means at a lower volume, we want to hear somebody, you know, whispering to us in the cave that you shouldn't go outside because there's a saber-toothed <laughs> tiger waiting to eat you. Well, and, you know, gr- growing up, our uh, receivers, our stereo receivers that we had at home, they always had this loudness button, right? Yeah. That we were always supposed to turn on whenever we turned the volume down. And it was based on specifically the Fletcher Munson curve. And so the Fletcher Munson curve was was our uh, was determined many, many years ago. And the uh, stereo manufacturers took it upon themselves to, well, we're going to help the consumer out. So if they want to turn it down, you got to turn this fl- this uh, loudness button on. And it, would, it was a smiley face. It'd raise the bottom end and raise the top end. And therefore, everything would sound cool. Yeah. Uh, down at a low level. Well, that's because we, of our human hearing problems down there. So. I think I thought about it as the always on button. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. thing, oh, hey, everything sounds better. And then you crank your speakers up and like, mm, my speakers yeah. sound like they're struggling at this yeah, level. Exactly. Well, cool. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. And it's interesting to think about you being able to hear those ticks and stuff like that at the low volume. Um, it's. I suppose maybe there's a technical aspect to that. Maybe there is some masking at the higher levels because there's more energy in the room and in the air, um, or maybe it's just a, like a, a the masking that happens at our ear or or mentally. No, it is a definite masking thing that happens at a higher level. You're you are hearing more bass. You are hearing more top end. So you're a lot more cognizant of those frequencies and you're less cognizant of the mid-range on a relative basis okay yeah so yeah it's just a loudness thing um well all right so let's let's keep moving forward there um what other kind of things might have needed to change in your room once you put the new speakers in anything else hmm nope (laughs) all right so (laughs) treatment stay the the same The room's great now. I, I, at this point, I would not change a thing. And did you come up with your own way of tabulating what you thought about things? Or was it just sort of a, um, like you said, you're training your ear to understand the new sound in your room. And and I get that because I, I did, um, worked with Carl Tatz to put in his speakers in my studio. And it wasn't, of course, in my situation, it wasn't too hard to change my train my ear because you walk in, you're like, oh my God, that sounds so much better than it used to. Mm-hmm. But um, 
But, you know, there is a part once of getting used to it and then just it's like building up a sense of confidence about what sounds good. Yeah. And, and it, okay. it, honestly, uh, the system I had prior to this was the MB2 uh, speakers. Uh, then, and now I'm on the MB3s. So the transition from those MB2s to 3s was not that dramatic. Uh, but it gave me a resolution level that I didn't have before. Uh, gained through the proficiency of the amplifiers that they're now making, the mm -hmm. marriage of the marriage of the amplifier to the uh, speaker system, um, and the extension of, fre of frequency response um, was just it's just as I say, mo better. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia, featuring the patented Golden Drop Capsule design for enhanced clarity that will give your recordings the classic vintage tone. Our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have also come up with a special offer only available to recording studio Rockstars listeners. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the V67, V47, or V12 microphones. And to make this deal even better, they'll throw in a free shock mount worth $120 for a limited time at jzmike.com. Adam Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you are setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class full-size studio for professional mixing and mastering in stereo or immersive sound. Featuring the XART tweeter and custom DSP onboard processing, the new A-Series monitors will perfectly adapt to your studio. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for you with an extended five year warranty at adamaudio.com. One of the things uh, that uh, I would agree with is uh, we put a, a playlist together. So rock stars, you can go scroll down into the show notes and go listen to a bunch of the records that John has, has done. And there's a consistent quality that is really awesome and has a <laughs> lot of Mo Beta in it. So <laughs> nicely done. Um, Very good. Uh, let's see what else. What else has um, changed for you around your studio? Now you, you know, of course, we're on the back end of of uh, a few years of craziness and lockdowns, mm -hmm. and you know, people working from home and all kinds of things. Um, have you guys found that that helps you sort of evolve how you do things in the studio, or or because you were mastering records in a room that you know by yourself a lot of times is is it pretty much the same? Business yeah. as usual. Yeah, it is business as usual. Um, we lost some clients, uh, and but at the same time, we started gaining clients. Uh, the independent market just has e exploded, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, and we're getting clients from uh, all over um, the world. That's great. And it's very interesting, to be honest with you. Now, uh, to uh, explain, though, a little bit about the change or lack of change, this is simply a business, mm -hmm. just like any other business. Um, we have to concern ourselves with profit and loss and spreadsheets, and um, it's, it's, it's just a standard business. There's no difference, with the exception of we love what we do so much. Yeah. And uh, even you get at, to listen to music all day. <laughs> oh God, yeah, right. And even here at the age of seventy-one, I still wake up every morning excited to come to work. That's great. Who else can do that? You know? I don't know. A lot of people retire before they get to seventy-one. I've noticed that. I'm not going to retire. They're going to have to drag me out of this room, <laughs> scraping my fingernails along the the floor. You know. No, That's I'll. I'll uh, decide to stop when my hearing requires me to do so. Oh man! Um, well, hopefully that ho well, hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, well, I think about that. You know, I remember meeting um, 
David Blackmer many years ago at Earthworks. I did an interview with him when I was young, before I knew mm -hmm. that I would do many interviews in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him about you know his design process, and and he said he his intention was to design great speakers. And when he was designing great speakers, he said, oh, I realize I need to, in order to design great speakers, I need to have a, uh, an excellent measurement microphone. <laughs> so then they started making microphones. Um, mm. But he pointed out he was talking about, you know, sample rates and extended top end and everything. And he said, you know, I don't remember, he was, he was, a lot quite old at that point when I met him. Mm. And he was saying that, you know, he couldn't even, if you just played a tone, he wasn't going to hear it up at a certain frequency, but he could ab absolutely hear the way the top end affected and interacted with all the music down in the frequencies that he, that he could hear really well. And that was sort of like a aha moment for me, realizing that, you know, all these frequencies and the sounds, everything's interrelated. It's all connected, you know? Absolutely. Um, and that, and that really, you know, this this idea of like our hearing changing in life as we work on music and do it for a long time. There's so many factors. There's like, there's the natural physical factor of you. You know, when when you're a kid, you just have this frequency response that's extended. A fresh fresh new year. There is this idea that um, our hearing grows and our understanding of it, what we're hearing as we do this professionally. Even you just described five days of learning what the new room sounds like. And then there's just the simple, um, and I know I'm talking a lot here, John, I'm going to turn this back over to you in a second. No, that's all right. But then there's just the simple idea that, well, of course, there's always going to be an extended, There, there are, it doesn't matter what age you are, there's always a range that's extended above what you can hear that's still folding back and affecting what you, what you do hear. So that's just interesting as a topic in general. And I've had people on the show talk about, um, tinnitus on the one hand. And then also I just get questions from our audience because there's a lot of us that are, um, you know, closer to my age and, and closer, closer to your age. And we all wonder about that question. Yeah. And you know, the last time I went and got my, my ears tested, the, um, um, the technician, uh, after the test looked at me and said, H how old are you? And I said, well, I'm so-and-so. And, -so. and he said, well, how can you, I said, it's just training. And literally it is training, learning to listen for things. And they, and they were quite astonished that I was able to hear up where I was telling them that I could hear. And I said, you know, it, you just got to learn. And yeah. in my, in my business, we end up, uh, well, we train ourselves to listen. So we do. Yeah, I remember the last time I did a test, they were like, I actually had to ask them to test in the higher ranges because I think the tests usually only go up to 8 or 12K or something. Yeah, and you know, the thing that, that I didn't really get on about, but the, the set of phones that I was using in the the anechoic chamber that I was in, I looked at the, the phones and I thought, oh my God, how old are these drivers? <laughs> you know, what efficiency do we have here to begin with? And they were really yeah. old. I thought, well, come on, guys. So those testing arenas are not really set up for us professionals. They're there for the common man. and, and uh, they're for, Yeah, they're for, for they're, hearing voice. Yeah, they're fine for that. So Yeah, yeah, yeah I had the, the tester who tested me said, like, wow, well, you got like kind of supersonic hearing up in this, <laughs> this top end. And I was like, well, I guess. I mean, I just, I just, I don't know. Whenever you played those high frequencies, all I heard was distortion. So I just <laughs> pressed the button. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Um, let's see, John. I'm going to kind of just go down through my questions here. I've still got this one that I like to ask some guests to share either an inspirational quote or talk about somebody that inspired them in music or maybe still inspires um, you. Does anything come to mind for you? Is there anybody that really inspires you musically um, or or uh, that you'd like to mention? Well, you know, uh, Al Schmidt, um, uh, who has recently passed um was somebody that really understood um music and the analog process and i uh as a matter of fact if you have a chance to read his book it's a wonderful read but his uh perspective on what music should 
sound like um, was something I always look back to and say, you know what? He was awesome. He was just great. And you can still go back and listen to anything that he recorded and use that as a reference for anything acoustic. Anything. Yeah. 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 I've had guests on the show talk about working with him and, you know, I feel like I've learned to have a greater appreciation for Omni mics, for example, things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Really yeah. understand off axis yeah. response and phase relationships and all that stuff. Yeah, his work with um, Diana Crawl, and mm -hmm. uh, I think his the producer was Tommy Lapuma at one point. But his, the albums that he did with uh, Diana Crawl are just uh, so transparent and so beautiful. The less is more perspective is is highlighted with his work, and you can just hear every nuance that was written. Um, and I don't know, I, I haven't run across a whole lot of people that have that kind of perspective. Did you have a chance to master any of his work? No, I didn't. Sadly. <laughs> Sadly. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, D Doug Sachs did most of his work and Doug has passed, of course, too. Mm. Uh, he, he was a great mastering guy. Yeah. Um, I well, listening to your discography, I hear a real appreciation for vocal. So I think that um, it seems that you have a lot of experience working with, you know, a, a featured artist as a singer, somebody with a with a big beautiful voice, and trying to make sure that that really sounds wonderful in the final. Well, the final they version. are uh, the vocalist is after all the primary product, you know. Um, and you, you can't allow them to be, um, um, overshown by the instrumentation. Uh, but then sometimes you get arrangers <laughs> who don't necessarily have that degree of appreciation. And so you have to kind of be careful to counteract that a little bit to make sure the vocalist has always got the spotlight. Spotlight yeah. is always the vocal. And um, sometimes it's hard to keep it, but it's always there. What about shoegazer music? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're not talking a bunch of indie rock at the moment. Mm. But, um, you know, what are some things that you... So you see arrangers sometimes sort of filling up space for the voice with mm -hmm. instrumentation? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I don't know, I don't recall whether I told the story, but many, many years ago, um, I had the opportunity to go to London and record the London Symphony. And uh, it was at CTS Studios, which is no longer there, but just about every uh, major motion picture score during the day had been cut there. John Williams and the whole, you know, crew, every, um, anyway. I had a chance to uh, work with the symphony there, and uh, the label um, sent over the primary producer and arranger, and then they sent over one of their staff uh, people to take advantage of the fact that we were in London and cutting the LSO. And um, so they threw him up in front of the orchestra first. And I went through you know, getting sounds and got everything ready. And uh, the producer steps up to the podium, taps and and uh, commences to direct the uh, orchestra you know, on his first track. And just, it just sounded like shit. It just didn't sound good. And I looked at the console, the big Neve con console, and it was, you know, it was just, everything was set up. Everything was perfect. And we all looked around in the control room and said, well, okay, all right. Guy went on to his second track again. It was just, ugh. It just wasn't, wasn't right. Mm -hmm. All right, so we he finished his thing, and then the, the actual main producer got up and introduced himself. Well, actually, he had done a lot of work with the LSO, and uh, they knew him real, real well. And um, he started in 
and the at the very first downbeat of the very first track, it was like the 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 heavens opened up, and it was gorgeous. And I did not touch one thing on that console, not one thing. And the sound was perfect. It was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And that was the instance that I thought, you know what? Arrangements really do count. So when the next producer got up, it was a different arrangement for the song. It wasn't, it wasn't oh, the same arrangement conducted differently or anything. A, no, a, uh, a, a, a completely different. We had started the first track of the album that we were there to cut, right? Mm. And it's completely different. Um, but it was the same style of music, of course. Yeah. But when he, when, <laughs> when that downbeat hit, it, it was like night and day. And boy, I tell you what, everybody in the, uh, control room had a huge smile. <laughs> <laughs> and was who great. who was singing again on that? So you could the, hear it. It was not a vocal session at that point. Uh, we were going to be overdubbing a large oh, choir. So this was just later. even just the instrumentation just, itself. It just sounded like a mess or like focused. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was. It, it was a simul session. We had eighty-five players or so, but in a, a room where eighty-five people only took up about half. Of it. it was a gorgeous room, big, tall ceilings. Anyway, um, uh, the the sound was so drastically different, but not one thing changed. Everybody was sitting in the exact same position, hmm. same microphones. Nothing was moved, but the arrangement was gorgeous. Yeah. Well, I feel like I, I'm familiar with that in the studio doing rock band kind of stuff, even doing overdubs myself this past weekend, you know, adding another guitar part and having some idea. And then I go into the other room and I listen, and I realize, oh, I'm stepping all over this other part because I just wasn't hearing it right or I wasn't yeah. conscious of it. And it changes the nature of the music so much to just play a couple of notes differently, you know, different well, voicing. Hey. A different octave, um, you know, less truly is always more, to be yeah. honest with you. And especially at the beginning, I think I, I'm a little more intuitive to that now, but <clears throat> at the beginning of doing all this, going into the studio and having somebody say, oh, the chord voicing on the guitar, you know, the vocals down in that range. And I, I would hear somebody say that and I'm thinking like, Oh my gosh, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, do I need to relearn how to play an E chord on the guitar? And, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's some simple things like sometimes just, I, I think just intuiting it, listening, you know, carefully, muting things in and out and listening to, uh, and I know we're, you know, we're talk here to talk about mastering, but if you don't have a mix that sounds, you know, you gotta, you gotta get the arrangement right and then the, the recording and then the mix right before you get to mastering. Although, I think as you, you'll point out, John, we can talk about the ways that mastering can really enhance um, a home recording situation that might have gotten some of those not not so perfect. Sure. Um, but, you know, the power of the mute button. The mute button is, is the <laughs> first, that's the first tool to learn. Absolutely, yeah. Mute, it, it, mute then fader. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know where, where Pan comes in because Pan is a little bit, a tiny bit of cheating. <laughs> well, Pan is very important because the the um, the mandated center image is uh, is your uh, vocal, uh, your bass, kick, snare, uh, conventionally, mm -hmm. and already it's pretty crowded, right? Right. All these things going on. And so if if you want things to work, you've got to use the entire stereo image. So you, I mean, if you've got all those four elements in the center image already and you throw in a, uh, a strumming acoustic guitar, well, no, that, that, that's, that's going to create a problem. So you pan it off to whatever. And uh, if, if you've got five guitars, probably you don't need all that. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. can try panning them out left and right and so forth. But but uh, a lot of times there's just elements in there that you just don't need. And you would be surprised how much louder things sound the less there is. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's more room for it to breathe and step forward. 
Exactly. Sonically, you know. Um, and uh, I think one of the things we try and learn is, is um, well, it's this weird combination between thinking of what's crowding out the vocal that is frequency related versus what's crowding out the vocal that is arrangement, you know, like just, just the octave mm -hmm. that instruments are playing in, which is of course, frequency related. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I didn't know we were going to go there, but I'm glad we did. Cause those are, <laughs> those are good topics. Absolutely. Hey, rock stars, are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble getting your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch or clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding a lot closer to professional mixes. And it's my free introductory course called Mix Master Bundle. This course shows you how to get pro sound with your mixes from your home studio using free plugins and Pro Tools. And and the best part is that these fundamental mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you're in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus, Studio One, Reaper, or whatever you're using. If you're ready to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com and get started now for free. And you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Now, I know that you guys have also, I think there's, you may have mentioned something about remote video mastering sessions or something like that on your website. Is that something that has sort of dialed in as a part of your process? Is there a part of mastering that involves um, working with the client and and them listening in while you're working or, or anything like that? Or is it more just, um, you know, what what is the process for you of the back and forth and including a client who's maybe not right there in Berry Hill for a mastering session. Yeah. Well, we, we don't do that much real time interaction. Um, and generally the process is uh, say on a, a, a given album, once we receive the documentation, which includes the sequence, which to me is extremely important. Um, we'll, I will go in and take the first track, once I've listened down to the whole thing and gotten a feel for where the album wants to end up sitting, I'll take the first track, master it, and send that off to the uh, client for the evaluation process. And if the client approves that mastering, then that template, in essence, will be used for the remainder. Um, and that's a pretty fail-safe way to go about it. Um, but once we do finish the whole album, we'll send all of those files to the to the client before uh, for approval and uh, make any changes if they want them uh, or if they catch any mix mistakes also, which happens quite often. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been there <laughs> and done that. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a fairly simple, easy process. Um, and it's worked for years and, but once you get that first song approved, uh, then <clears throat> things should go fairly smoothly. Now, <laughs> over the years, there have been, uh, I can count them on one hand, <clears throat> instances where the approval of the first track was given and then we finished the whole thing and then they go back and say, you know what? <laughs> I changed my mind, you know, and right. so, you know, I, I would really like to have a little bit more bass overall or a little this or that, you know, which is, which is fine, but, um, we're on, we're on the clock and, uh, it all gets, gets done. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. yeah. Well, I imagine mastering has some different stages to, uh, you know, technically like there's a, there may be a, or at least in my experience, I've seen that sometimes there's a transferring the track back into the mastering um, setup through some analog gear, and then there's maybe a digital stage. Um, what, what, mm. how, how should we think about that? Should we, maybe we shouldn't think about that. Maybe well, it's, just, that's, it's, to take it's care of that. opening up kind of a big uh, can of, uh, of worms um, because there are many mastering guys that uh, prefer to use analog only, uh, prefer to use, some of them use a hybrid 
Uh, some of them use strict, strictly digital. And at this point, uh, it may surprise you, but I am strictly dig. Okay, and cool. Well, that's exciting because I, I know we've got lots to talk about there too. Well, I, I I started out in all analog because back in the day, we didn't have any digital tools at all. Yeah. So we had a few, but they just didn't sound well, very good. they were just <laughs> terrible. You couldn't do anything. At any rate, so uh, everything was done in the uh, analog world. And then um, some of the equipment manufacturers came out with uh, hardware digital pieces. Weiss, for one, uh, came out with a DS1, the EQ1, and so forth. And we could uh, do some um, dynamic processing in the digital world, but there were hardware pieces that were just awesome. Mm -hmm. So I uh, started using those along with the analog. And it's kind of funny, over, over the years there, uh, there was a very linear um, transition for me from an, from analog to digital. And it was strictly related to the ability of the code writers to write code, digital code, and give us the things we actually wanted. Well, they, you know, the original plugins that uh, came out were just hideous. They were just terrible. And they weren't written correctly, and they weren't giving us the things we needed. And so finally, they started saying, well, what do you want? Well, we started telling them we need this and that. We need uh, mid-side. And so, and they said, oh, you want that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so finally, they started manufacturing plugins that uh, gave us the things we needed. And so, quite literally, I would take a track and analog or uh, mastered in in analog, and then I'd go back and pull up a strictly digital flow and see if I could either equal it or better it. And initially, I could not better it. And literally, as the manufacturers started issuing plugins that were written uh, more efficiently and gave us the controls we needed, I was able to, uh, in for my money, create a better product in the digital world. So at this point in time, I'm strictly in the uh, digital world because there are some absolutely um, uh, brilliant people writing code nowadays. Yeah. And they understand what we are looking for. They are emulating some of the non-linear analog pieces of gear that we all grew up with. And of course, you know, back in the day, we would choose to use a particular compressor or EQ because of the footprint that that gear had. Is a and and every analog piece of gear is considered non-linear, right? So, right, uh, they have <clears throat> learned how to copy the non-linearity of those analog of the sweet analog pieces pretty well, pretty well. And honestly, it's it's uh, they've made them uh, a little bit more efficient, a lot more efficient, and they sound great. Now, there's a lot of crap out there in the plug-in arena. There's a lot of just terrible stuff. It's not written well. They sound terrible. But once you weed through all of that stuff and you get down to the ones that 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 uh, really sound good, well, you know what? Digital has come a long way. Yes, indeed. And and um, there are, um, we can maybe get into this here in a minute, but you've done some wonderful videos talking about some of this stuff with uh, Adam Audio. You guys did a nice series, mm -hmm. Mastering Masterclass. And um, we'll try and include a link to that uh, for the YouTube, or you can mm -hmm. just go find it on YouTube, Rockstars. But it's great. I mean, you know, you talk about Isotope and Ozone, and RX. Uh, actually, you also use, um, um, is it Cedar? Is that the one? Yeah, Cedar Retouch. I use that on just about every session because just about every file that I get, I can find some sort of noise that is not musical, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, any sound that I hear that is 
that distracts me from the listening process on that particular, you know, whatever song, if it distracts me and it's not musical and it wasn't intentional, like uh, a guitar squeak that is really loud, I can go in with Cedar and just tell Cedar I don't like that sound. I either want to remove it or change the level. And yeah. boom, it's done. It takes 15 seconds, you know? Yeah. So Cedar is a huge tool that I couldn't really work without. Now, there are some um, Isotope um, mm -hmm. has Our, their their RX. version, or RX, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah, has their version of it, which is quite uh, effective. But um, uh, Cedar works native in Pyramix, which is what I use. And so it's just extremely fast. Right on. Well, it's pretty cool. I remember when the, um, what, what do we call that where it's the graphic, you see the colors on the screen? Was that FFT? I suppose, yeah. Something like that. I remember when that it, first appeared and it was like, oh, you could take a picture and drop it in there and it'll make sounds. And you're listening, you're like, what the <laughs> hell sound is that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's the sound of uh, yeah, Starry Night by Van Gogh. Yeah, the uh, visual correlation of the audio that Cedar gives us is, uh, gosh, it's it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can see things that you think you can hear a sound and you can zoom in and say, oh, there it is. Wow. Yeah. Let's deal with that. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Well, yeah. the, the way that I um, think of that is... It's a little bit like photo retouching where, you know, the, the magazine cover, you have a photograph of somebody, but somehow they just like, you know, it it, it lets people look really, uh, take away some of the, you know, the whiskers the and things like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And an, another thing that I use Cedar for is rebalancing. Um, uh, for instance, in a, in a given bass line over you know, five or six measures, whatever. If there's a particular note that sticks out, well, all I have to do is pull up Cedar, go down into the low frequency analysis arena, and you can literally see the notes. And you just literally draw a rectangle around any given note that you want to adjust. You can, and just type in the value, the gain value you want. Wow. And, it, it, it's, and it takes seconds. You know, and and I do that quite often. Yeah, that's wild. Now, I guess we can do that at our mix as well, um, because <laughs> well, we have the bass track, the original one. But sometimes we miss it until later. It, you're supposed to, but uh, John, what was your instrument again? Well, I started out on guitar at the guitar, age of okay, that's right. yeah, at the age of thirteen, but then switched over to bass. And I got to tell you, the bass instrument is one of the most it is the most, well, for me, the most fun instrument in the world to play because it's, to me, uh, a the bass is also lives in the percussion world. Yeah. If you know how to uh, put your feet in both of those camps with a bass guitar, God, is it fun. Jesus. It's so fun because you're establishing the foundation from which everything is built on. Yeah, well, the bass is such a critical instrument for what we do in music, too, because it's it's that thing that when it's right, it lets you just sort of like turn up the music and, and it just sort of hugs, the music hugs you, you know, it reaches around and makes you feel all good inside. Absolutely. And and, and the, the, the thing that, that really uh, bothers me the most is when bass players don't acknowledge their responsibility to the percussion area because oh they will hit a whole note <laughs> and let it ring through an and uh, you know two or three or four measures and it's like no <laughs> don't you realize the kick drum is coming down on two you know it 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 just frustrates me so much because you're, you're they speaking my language, John. You're speaking they, my language. Man. They miss the opportunity to really create an awesome groove, and I hear it so much. Uh, they may have a a really nice sound, but they they miss the point, and they miss that opportunity to marry themselves with that kick and create and lift a note. You know, lift a note. 
um, to prepare for the next. Anyway, it's it's just a way of playing that I think a lot of bass players miss out on. But boy, when I hear one that understands it and knows how to uh, marry with the uh, percussion, it's like butter. Oh, God, I love it. <laughs> it just makes you feel so good. You know? That's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always struck by how how much power is in the fingers of a bass um oh, part huge on and it's and I think and granted there are all sorts of styles of music so there are you know wild rock and roll styles where maybe the bass is meant to be exactly. distorted and and rocked out with a pick but um honestly guess what happens to a lot of those bass parts in the mix it gets turned down and treated like a guitar yeah, and, and then and then there's a discussion about well, this style of music just doesn't have as much bass in it. <laughs> and then there's the uh, oct- the the harmonic structure of the bass. Um, if you're told that let's say um, a song is going to be in the key of uh, A, okay, well you're going to be playing your root on the A string. Well, that's not necessarily going to provide you with a, you know, that gut, uh, you know, uh, ballsy bottom end that you're looking for. Well, okay, then you need a five string to go down a little bit lower. Well, if you get too low on on the five, then some speaker systems are not going to play it back. But if you've got your harmonics set up correctly, the sound of the actual bass itself, such that the uh, upper harmonics are audible, then on inefficient um, speaker systems, you're still going to feel the bass, know it's there. Um, and when you get basses that don't have the upper harmonics structured appropriately, then it just turns into a thing of, uh, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it it gets so detailed and it's so important and it gets overlooked a lot of times because people are trying to get through a track, get it done, go on to the next one. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, no, I just I just find that you know work. I work with a lot of independent bands and things like that, and and I think mm-hmm. that often you just you don't understand the power of the arrangement between a kick and a bass and how that all adds up to a final mix coming out of the speakers and how, you know, that can become the very hook of the groove of a song it, until you hear it, you know, until yeah. you until you start composing it that way. And when when a song is just sort of in a rehearsal space with bad sounding um, amps and, and everything sounds a little crazy, you know, everybody thinks, ah, it felt good because we were all, you know, yeah, looking grieving. at each other and rocking out, but but you know, <laughs> not realizing that there's a real opportunity for what can come out of the speakers in a final production. Absolutely, and the backbeat is so important, and that's created nine times out of ten by the uh, snare. And that backbeat, and uh, of course, genre specific, is so important to the groove. So you marry all a great backbeat to a great bass and kick and you're, you're almost home. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <You know? laughs> nice. So don't ignore all that stuff, guys. It's, it's, it's so important and it's overlooked so often. So anyway. OWC is your one-stop shop for flexible drive storage and connectivity solutions for your studio. The Mini Stack STX for your Mac Mini adds two additional drives over a universal SATA HDD SSD bay and an NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD slot, plus three additional Thunderbolt USB-C ports. Or the OWC Thunder Bay 4 chassis, built like a tank, gives you four hot swappable 2.5-inch RAID configurable drive bays, plus an extra Thunderbolt 3 jack for daisy chaining up to five devices. Or check out the OWC Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock with two RAID configurable drives and seven ports of connectivity, including a front side SD card reader, one gig ethernet, two USB 3.2 ports, and a dedicated display port, plus an additional backward compatible Thunderbolt port. Get your studio connected with the Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt 
Thunder Bay 4 and Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Use the custom link in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. Attention, all rock stars. Isotope has got you covered. With RX, Ozone, Neoverb, Nectar, and Vocal Synth, you'll have a collection of powerful apps and plugins that will help you get a professional sound in no time. Whether you're looking to clean up your vocal recordings with RX, master your tracks with Ozone, or add depth and ambience to your mixes with Neoverb, Isotope is your magic wand for awesomeness. Plus, with Nectar and Vocal synth you can easily add creative effects and unique textures to your vocals and instruments from subtle mix enhancements to extreme sound design isotope takes your music and podcasts to the next level go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code rock 10 to get 10 percent off any plugin purchase Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is John Mayfield, joining us from Mayfield Mastering in Berry Hill. And uh, John, are you ready to to jam? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, sweet. So we talked about a lot of cool stuff. Um, I know that, you know, the process of mixing is really critical um, just to make good music, but it's also an important part of, you know, how that integrates with the mastering process. So... Are there more thoughts that come to mind for you about stuff that that we're doing at the mix and and what we what we might want to be aware of and what we might want to be thinking of delivering to you as a mastering engineer? Sure. And of course, my comments are going to be genre specific. Um, I am going to uh, anything that I'm talking about uh, coming up is going to be specific more to uh, commercial music. Now, uh, as opposed to classical music, uh, classical right. music, you just you just stay away from doing any funny stuff, uh, and so you do what the conductor created. Mm-hmm. Um, so beyond that, when you get into commercial music, you have to start thinking about dynamic range um, and loudness, overall loudness. What um, is the genre you're working in, is it intended to be incredibly loud or just rhythmic and feel good? Uh, is it, you know, what? So you've got to pr- be able to prepare your mix in such a way that it can be raised in level, if necessary, without destroying the transients. Okay? Mm-hmm. So you've the mixer, it's incumbent upon the mixer to deal with the natural dynamics that he's got recorded. Now, um, when you're working at 24 bit, you've got a dynamic range of 144 dB, right? Well, you, you can't, (laughs) you can't deal with 144 dB, a dynamic range in the real world In the real world in commercial music. If you're the space shuttle, I think you can. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, sure. We'll, (laughs) we'll call Musk about that. At any rate, um, in the, uh, the real world, we're on a standard view meter, you know, you're looking at, uh, what, 23 dB of meter movement. Okay. And in some commercial hard rock music, uh, the meter is not going to move a bunch. Uh, it's going to start loud and pretty much end loud, and then it's just going to be loud. Well, unless you prepare your mix correctly um, to be at that level uh, or to be taken to that level by us, you can't send us a mix that's got uh, a gross exaggeration, 50 dB of dynamic range. Well, that's not going to work. So you've, you've got to be smart about where your genre is going to want to live in the yeah. level world. Uh, and I've, I've experienced that. I, I've been, you know, sitting with the mastering engineer and saying, hey, 
what, let me let me play this track by Tame Impala, you know, and then and then can, how do I make my music sound like that? And he just says, first, well, you got to mix it that way first, you know. Exactly, and it, it you've got to be cognizant of your crest factor, and of course, the crest factor is the difference between your full scale digital value and your RMS. Well, uh, if you've got uh, a hard rock piece, let's say, and your RMS is down at for gross exaggeration, minus 23, but yet your full-scale digital value is at zero, all right? Well, the one thing you and I have in common is zero. Neither one of us can go over that, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. <laughs> Maybe in a magical world, but not our world. So you've got to create a situation where when I bring your RMS up, that that element that is creating that full-scale digital value of zero <clears throat> doesn't get annihilated. Well, it will be annihilated. Uh, the sound of it is just not going to be maintained. That's a mixing mistake, okay? And if that, uh, if I receive a file like that, the first thing, first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to pick up the phone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Say, dude, uh, we need to talk about this, and you need to rethink your mixing approach. Okay, so we get into the whole class thing. Well, um, so it's it's all about knowing how to control <clears throat> or adjust your uh, dynamic range to meet the needs of the medium of the genre, rather um, that this particular song is going to live in. Because if it wants to be loud, then your mix needs to be loud but then there's a line you can go past where it's too loud yeah i think i just stepped you, all over that line this weekend yeah you did rough mixes <laughs> well i mean i i know yeah. what you're saying so it's like i've you know i found myself i find i find myself in a place where i'm trying to i want i want the mix to be loud loud and proud right and competitive yep. and um and at the same time, then I scratch my head and think, should this sound distorted on the iPhone speaker? Which I don't know if you'll you'll mm -hmm. you know slap me across the head um, no, know, no. on the top of the head, give me a little <clears> knock <throat> on the head for for bringing up an iPhone speaker, or, or if you say that's that's a relevant thing. But um, for example, I just did an interview with Bill Simzik, and I was listening to the you know that discography, and I'm thinking like, you know, it's quieter, but everything sounds great, and you know. Nothing's distorting on the on the speaker, so I'm, I feel like I'm always caught in that, and I think that that speaks to what you're saying, which is that is that relationship of what genre, how loud does it need to be? And I always forget. My girlfriend corrects me on if it's genre or genre, but <laughs> genre. I always get it backwards. <laughs> it's all good. Well, it, it's it's uh, it's a sweet spot that you've got to find for the mix, and it's a gray area. All right. Um, and there's a line where you can cross over and go too far. And it just, I, my hands are tied and I can't do anything. Sounds like shit. Uh, but then if you get up to that line and just sort of kiss it, then it's my responsibility to sit back and say, you know what? I, I need to, to take a hands-off approach. This mix sounds perfect. All right. All I need to do is make sure that technically it's structured um, uh, correctly for the world. And that has to do with um, full scale digital value um, uh, and for and uh, the format. So um, it's a fine line knowing how far to go, how much room to um, give your mastering guy or a person rather, um, to, to, to work. But, you know, there's, uh, I get a lot of people saying, well, I've always heard that, you know, I do my mixes and put, put, uh, limiters and compressors on my two mix bus and so forth, uh, and, uh, do what I need to do and make it sound good. And then to send the, to send the master and pull all of that, uh, DSP off. I said, wrong, it, that's completely the wrong thing to do because you have created your mix, your sonic values relative to what the DSP is doing on your two mix bus. So 
by all means, leave your Tumix on, your Tumix uh, DSP on. Send that to me, all right? Create a file with that on it so I know it, it, at least where you were shooting, what you were shooting for. And if it's correct, if it's structured correctly and has the right amount of crest factor for me to do what I need to do, well, then I'm going to end up using it. But then you can also send another version that's uh, where the amount of, of um, limiting and compression is a, a less, let's say. Uh, well, does it sound good to you? Well, if it starts sounding better to you, well, it, create those files also. And we'll decide between the two of us which file will work better for the end product. So I encourage everybody to use the 2Mix bus as a creative tool. It's there for you to use. Yeah. And you should use it, crying out loud. Uh, don't be afraid to do that. Now, uh, you know, this gets into the whole thing of of uh, uh, mixing philosophies. And back when I was uh, mixing, I um, I used what commonly now is referred to as stems. Um, I worked on, uh, I got introduced to it on an old SSL. Uh, it was called 6000, which was a broadcast version of the, of the 4000. But what additionally it had was it had three dedicated stereo bus sub buses uh, before entering the uh, two mix bus, well, there is where I learned to start using uh, compression and limiting on those on those subs or now stems, and it made mixing so much easier for me. Um, uh, so what I encourage people to do is to set your console up when you're mixing uh, with stems, with logical stems. Okay. Um, uh, drum stem, bass stem, uh, guitars, keys, and uh, determine your stem arrangement based on the arrangement of, of whatever's you know recorded. But at least then have a BGV stem and solo uh, vocal stem, and that way you can go and and put little limiters and and compressors to start um, adjusting dynamic range. A little bit on those stems mm -hmm. so that by the time you get to the two mix bus all you're doing is really kissing it and making sure you don't have any overs right um, as opposed to feeling like we need to see you know the, the meters flying all over the place on our stereo exactly. compression and limiter yeah yeah and and so uh it's all about uh adjusting dynamic range in a graceful and artistic way without destroying the original recordings. But you've got to adjust the original recordings because what you've got originally recorded has too much dynamic range. You can't right. use all that. Yeah. So you've got diamonds in the rough on your multi-track that need to be polished. And you start polishing them on the individual track with a little EQ, um, uh, compression, limiting, whatever you want to do. But you start uh, fine tuning the sounds at their origin and then you get down to your stems and you're uh, you're like painting a picture an oral picture with uh, you know five six seven eight faders that you can just artistically move and 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 it's, it's it it makes life so much easier and by the way once you've established that stem arrangement you should really burn those to a file because uh, the artist can later on then monetize those stems if the film business comes to you and say, "Hey, we'd like to use this cut in X X film. Do you have the uh, Do you have the uh, stems?" And <laughs> if if you can sit down and say, "Yes, I do," well, that's what the the film biz business wants because they want to be able to adjust a mix based on the dialogue that's going on. And the script, I, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but no, that's this, right. It's, yeah, I this, think the, the lesson is don't be like Cheech and Chong and say, What do you mean, man? The stems and the seeds is the first thing we got rid of. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if, if you've created an opportunity for your artist to monetize the asset uh, even further beyond the original intent with the stems, then you're golden, you're going to get hired again. And you've killed two birds with one stone. You've created a mixing scenario that is just very 
artful and efficient and easy. And then you also have helped the artists out later on too. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I encourage stemage. <laughs> I encourage, encourage stemage, stemage, uh, stem on. Yeah. Um, so I, I, so we certainly hear about uh, the topic of stems. You know, I think sometimes we wonder if we're talking about, you know, is that is, you know, submixing things in groups, which kind of is the same thing as stems. Um, yeah. But remembering to print them, we can set up our mix templates, rock stars in ways that the stems are happening on on tracks um, that then feed the stereo bus so that we can, when we when we record the stereo mix into our session, if we do it that way, we can also record those stems on their own individual buses so that you've, you're sort of printing everything all at once. That can also be done even if you're using the bounce feature in Pro Tools, for example, you know, you just you just bounce out multiple outputs and buses at the same time. Yeah. So there okay, are ways now, to do it. Now, Lynch, you you mentioned some something there that uh, I uh, have. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to get on my soapbox about do it. mixing uh, in the non real time arena uh, in Pro Tools and a lot of the DAWs. You can do what what's called a bounce which is not offline, yeah. offline bouncing. Huge, huge mistake. Okay, I great. Tell us I why. Don't, I do not want anybody listening to this podcast to ever create a final mix in anything other than real time. Number one, you're supposed to be listening back empirically to your mix once you're laying it down, once you've done all this focused work on fixing this and that and mixing this and that, you need to be able to sit back, listen to the entire mix uh, from a global pers perspective to QC what you're doing. And uh, I mean, aside from that, we have proven scientifically <laughs> that uh, not, I don't think there's a, DAW on the market right now that will guarantee you 100% factory spec at anything other than real time. And this gets down to um, um, third party plugs. Okay. I, I, I'm not going to name names, but there, I don't think you can look to, at uh, many third party plugs that can work at sam sample rates. Let's say you're working at 96. And you're off offline bouncing at three or four times speed. Well, what sample rate is that? Well, <laughs> there there was an instance many many years ago. I was working with a mixer, and he called me about a, a uh, an album, and he said, "You know, John, I I'm off offline bouncing, and I'll sit back and listen to the offline bounce, and there's something." missing there's something i can't put my finger on but it's not the same as what i've been listening to in real time it doesn't feel there's something all right well i, I said all right send me a real-time bounce and send me the offline bounce and i'll check them well mm -hmm. i just performed a simple null test and oh my god if it was proper you would hear nothing if the offline bounce was perfect, you mm -hmm. would hear nothing. Oh my God! I was hearing guitar parts. I was hearing reverbs. It was it was it was <laughs> ridiculous. And <laughs> from that day forward, I tell everybody that I work with: do not send me a file that you number one haven't listened to to begin with before yeah. you send it to me. But you should be listening to it in real time. And your uh, DAW is going to work at, fact, at factory spec. All of your plugins are going to work at factory spec. And you're going to get what you paid for, okay? And you're also not going to screw up the heads and tails of these uh, files. Um, a lot of times your reverbs will be set up on a virtual basis, okay? You don't have a file. It's all virtual. And you set your regions <laughs> When you're off, your offline bouncing, uh, bouncing, you set your region 
top and bottom. But then <laughs> at the, the very end, the uh, virtual uh, reverb is actually lasting longer. Right. I can't tell you the number of tracks I've gotten in with the reverb just to cut off. <laughs> God, it just drives me insane. So Don't they call that a New York <laughs> fade? <laughs> <laughs> I call it a damn mistake. So <laughs> the, the I, I just want, uh, I want to impress upon your listeners that <clears throat> the process of creating your art is a constant QCing what you're doing. And when you are satisfied with your mix that you've listened to in real time, the you know, the whole time, you're not mixing in, in anything other than real time. Well, you need to transfer and burn that mix in real time. Nice. Just and that way you are guaranteed that what you work so hard on is being uh, recorded and your heads, your the top of the file is good. The back end of the file is good. Everything's great. And then you need to listen to that file back again, because I don't trust any computer on this planet <laughs> to do what it's supposed to do. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, 999 times out of a thousand, it will. But there's that one time that a computer will poop on you. Yeah. I've had it. I've, I've had it happen. And it's like, oh, God. Yeah. So, And you before, don't want that to be the time that it was heading out to the world for everybody to hear. Well, and well, it's going to go to mastering, you know, from, you know, from the mixer standpoint, it's going to go to mastering. I'm going to catch the problem. Well, you don't want that. Come on. Yeah. You know, QC your work at every step before you send to mastering. Yeah. And then that, that's a reminder um, that that's another step that has to happen post mastering before it gets published to the Abs world as well. Absolutely. Every file, every final uh, master that I come up with goes to the client first <laughs> and uh, the client's got to, uh, to approve it and say it's, you know, good before we create the uh, deliverables. Yeah. Atom Audio introduces the all-new A-Series line of monitors, featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, built-in DSP-based room correction, and speaker voicings, allowing you to customize your Atom Audio monitors to fit your control room. The A-Series will rock in any studio. Small studio spaces or immersive multi-speaker configurations are perfect for the A4V or the new A7V, the next generation of the incredible popular A7X. Mid-sized rooms and narrow spaces will love the low profile of the A44H, expanding on the A7V sound, or the A77H, a true three-way midfield monitor delivering rich, spacious sound. And bigger studios will love the A8H, a three-way speaker and the pinnacle of the A-series that delivers extremely accurate sound required for critical listening environments. Get the Atom Audio Monitor Monitors and subwoofers that are right for your studio with an extended five year warranty at adamaudio.com. Every studio needs a good vintage mic for that classic warm sound. Whether you're looking for those airy highs, sweet mid range, or silky low end, a good vintage mic can put the magic in your mixes. So it's no wonder vintage mics have been loved and praised by thousands of engineers for decades. The Jay Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia using only the best electronic components and feature the patented Golden Drop capsule design for great detail and richness of tone that will bring that classic vintage vibe to your studio and be a real workhorse for your sessions. This time, our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer just for you, rock stars. Use the coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the Vintage Series mics V67, V47, or V12, the mic you're hearing right now. Plus, they'll throw in a free shock mount worth $120 for a limited time at Jay-Z Microphones. Mike.com. And then what is the proper or what is the preferred way to deliver 
the files for um, let's let's just stick to digital distribution since that's the majority of what people are doing now. I would I would say right. Is, well, yeah, the the uh, uh, most all the streaming services are offering high res. Okay, mm-hmm. well that's twenty four bit. And they're up to 192. I mean, you can literally send a 24-bit 192 file to digital distribution, and uh, everybody's happy. Now, does that have to be, does the record need to have been recorded in 24192, or is that something that can happen at the mastering stage if we were working in, say, 2448 the whole time? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. We do not upsample. Um, we did a bunch of high res uh, mastering for Universal this this summer, where they went back and and uh, went after uh, old analog tapes and old analog masters from classic albums that we all grew up with and so forth. Well, they uh, were able to, in some instances, when they found the analog masters, they were able to transfer them twenty four bit to. Sometimes they chose one. 92, a lot of times they chose 96, but there was a strict rule that said that you are not allowed to upsample. So Mm -hmm. we master at the sample rate of the file that we that we receive. We never upsample. So if you send me a 24-bit 48k, yeah, I'm gonna work at 32-bit 48k internally, but I'm going to dither that down to 24-bit. And uh, 48K and use that as the delivered format. Uh, broadcast Wave also. Okay, and, cool. And I would suggest always using Broadcast Wave as your de facto uh, format. Are there some other formats that creep up as far as, I mean, I think people, of course, sometimes accidentally think they can work from an MP3, but hopefully not many of our listeners are still thinking that right now. Oh, my God. Bless their hearts. No. I Don't mean, sure, it. you can grab an MP3 and make a you know a snare sample out of it and go from there. But yeah, you can. But not your master file. Oh God, no, no. Um, I, but are there other formats? I mean, is AA? Uh, AI, what is it? AIFF. AF, yeah. Yeah. Is that we, still showing it, up? Every once in a while, we'll receive one. It's been months uh, since we received one. You know, we can deal with any file format you actually, you know, you uh, send. But uh, the uh, preferred format is WAVE or Broadcast WAVE. And, of course, the only difference between Broadcast WAVE and WAVE is the fact that Broadcast WAVE has a time code stamp built into the file. Yeah. Which, by the way, will save your ass one day. If you're recording in Broadcast WAVE and, I don't know, something happens in your DAW or your computer or whatever and files get all screwed up, if you've got the original time code stamped into your wave, you're golden. You can reassemble the project, and you're you're totally good. Hmm. So always cut with broadcast wave format. And is that an option, uh, to your knowledge, that we have at a you know creating a Pro Tool session, for example, we can choose. Yeah. Broad- I know we can do wave. I just wasn't aware whether it was broadcast or not. It better be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, now, there is another little broadcast wave feature that I started uh, learning about recently. It's related to this podcast. If I do, and it, let's say I was at your studio and we were doing an in-person interview, um, I would probably bring over my sound device's mix pre, and it has a little marker button on it, and it drops markers into the file that get exported, and those markers also live inside a broadcast wave file. Mm-hmm. And then I can extract them mm-hmm. in um, in Reaper, and then export those as MIDI files, and then bring those into Pro mm-hmm. Tools. And then I've got mm-hmm. markers and stuff. So mm-hmm. it's a little bit complicated, but there's some cool stuff in there that you discover when you when you start digging into it. Absolutely. So yeah, um, let's let me rewind a little bit. And can you explain um, briefly to the rock stars who may not know what that null test is? Okay. Well. For instance, if you take um, the standard procedure would be, let's say you've got in your EDL, you've, your edit decision list, you've got a stereo file. All right, you clone it, okay, and put it on two stereo uh, tracks that are right below. And they are, and you make sure that they're sample accurate sunk up. 
play the if on uh, the second file, if you take that file and flip it, flip both channels 180 degrees out of phase. And again, if you're in 100% sync, when you play those two files together, the output would equal zero. No data would come out because the 180 degree file that's below it is canceling 100% of the file above it, right? Right. Okay. That's a standard test that you use for checking for issues. Now, when mixes, when alternate mixes come in, let's say, and we want to verify the integrity of the new mix, a lot of times, uh, let's say they've said, all right, this new mix has vo vocal up by a dB, or they've changed the guitar level, or they've created, or they added another part. Well, a lot of times I will do a null test on the new mix to verify what they've told me, because a lot of times <laughs> what they've told me, they've maybe not have told me everything. Well, yeah, we'll we might start hearing things if they are using uh, non-linear uh, plugs that, um, like in reverbs and stuff, that have mm -hmm. different different time cyclic time coefficients that are going to be different every time you play them. Well, all right, yeah, we're going to hear those things. But we can verify that, yeah, there's a new guitar part, and yeah, the vocal is up 1 dB. So uh, it's just uh, one of the things we do to kind of verify things and to check. Well, that's just a cool experiment for us, too, because um, so Rockstars, again, to reiterate that, it's like just take two mixes that are supposed to be the same, pull them into your DAW as two tracks, you know, one above the other, and then make sure make sure they are lined up perfectly, which means sample accurately. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you flip the polarity of one of them, you know, when when the waveform was going up, now the waveform's going down and, you know, at first instead, then they should cancel each other out when they're added back together in the mix. Now, the other important thing is um, we don't want to change the panning. Well, there wouldn't be panning. These would be stereo files, but don't even change the level, the playback level of the files, unless they're leave them both at zero, for example, on the fingers. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's a cool experiment. I, you know, I haven't tried that, but you know, every once in a while, just pulling in these alternate mixes and, or even like you said, the same mix tw that you printed twice. Mm -hmm. and try and cancel them and see if they do cancel. Because if they don't, like you said, that means that each mix is slightly different from each other. Right. Uh, with the exception of plugins that have cyclic time coefficients, they're, you know, the uh, the um, waveform of the reverb is going to crest at different times every time you play it. It's going right. to sound it's going to sound the same, but the position of the wave is going to be slightly different. And well, all, and then here's you you maybe don't get so many flanged bridges anymore in your in your yeah. what you're mastering. I don't know, but that's another good example. Uh, and I've talked mm -hmm. about that recently, which is things that are doing, you know, um modulation effects that are happening in plugins, unless they're printed that way. If they're printed yeah. Well, now, if you printed your reverb, they would they would cancel out, right? They would be one hundred percent in well in or out of phase, but they but they would be correct. And yeah. that's and that's another thing. Um, working without printing your effects, um, I think it's kind of a mistake because in the archive process, if uh, a label wants to go back five or ten years and pull up. Uh, an old mo uh, Pro Tools or you know whatever session, unless those effects were committed to audio, they're really they might not be able to pull up the the original mix because the plugins that were used back ten years ago aren't even available now, and so I think it's always a good idea, especially from an archival standpoint, um, to print your effects, regardless of what they are. Uh, so uh, they, so you've got them as part of your, uh, your master uh, file folder and they're there and they're going to pull into the session and boom, you hit play. You've got the original mix. Yeah. And I think that goes for sessions in general, Rockstars. If you really want to archive something, 
commit all the tracks if you can before putting the session away so that when you come back, because I've already come back and tried some of, let me put it this way, it doesn't even take an archival label situation. It just takes a band coming back and saying, hey, let's let's put out that song we did, you know, 15, mm-hmm. 16 years ago. Yeah. And then you go, okay, let me, let me check the mix and master it. And you realize you can't find it and you can't open the session, you know. Yeah, your 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 DAW version doesn't really uh, rec- recognize the version that the session was cut on. So, but if you've got your wave files, you're golden. Yeah. Howdy, rock stars! Do you ever feel like you're spending all this time watching YouTube videos, trying out mixing tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes, but it's just like not getting you anywhere? Have you ever wished that you could have more of a simple and straightforward process for creating a pro mix that wouldn't take you years to learn? Look, what if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all of your mixing struggles and could actually coach you through them? If these are any of the questions that you're struggling with, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover this proven step-by-step mixing system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. It was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. That's from David P. Look, if you already understand the basics of mixing, but you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and check it out. In fact, I'm so confident that you're going to love this, that if you can't get a great sounding mix within 30 days, just send me an email and I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So go ahead and take your mixes to the next level like you know you want to at ultimatemixingmasterclass.com. Okay, here's the thing that you, um, I think it might have been with um, Daniel Ford, uh, aka Dr. Ford on the on the podcast previously talking about this. I think mm. that was, that's who brought it up, but it was a topic of, um, in this case, I think it was gaining a little bit more, um, level boost in a mastering using something called phase rotation. <laughs> and, and that set me on a search because somebody else asked about it. I was like, I don't really know anything about that. So I started searching and then I stumbled on this great video from John Mayfield <laughs> Talking about fixing phase rotation. And I was yeah. like, what the? Well, I went to school for this shit and I've been doing this for years and I never even heard of that. So this, tell us a yeah. little bit about what this is all about. Oh, this is something I learned uh, uh, a long time ago, actually. It's uh, in RX, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, it's um, Isotope RX, right? Isotope RX, RX yeah. yeah. Um, they, you, which, by the way, is, is a wonderful. Um, standalone plug or a uh, uh, device, so to speak. Yeah. I have a lot of corrective tools in there. But at any rate, uh, the, the uh, story was I, I was mastering a big band album and I got to this Trabone solo and I couldn't master it without it just totally distorting. I thought, what the heck? And I, I did everything I could to try and keep, to stop distortion. And I couldn't. So I call the mix guy and I I said, uh, David, is, did, did you realize anything funny about that trombone solo? And he said, now that you mention it, I noticed that in Pro Tools, the waveform, it was about five or six dB hotter on the plus side of the curve than it was on the bottom side of the curve. I have so seen that. Oh, and I've God. seen it on horn well, parts. That is, a, and, and it happens a lot in uh a lot in uh, more pure tones than it does complex tones. Complex tones be like sax and so forth. But at any rate, I said, well, um, uh, funny enough, that night before, I had just curled up with the, <laughs> the new manual on RX, and um, I read this one paragraph about that very thing. And so w- what happens in that instance is, the digital value, uh, gain value of that file 
is off is wrong, okay, by the amount of the disparage or the difference between the plus and the minus. So it creates a false digital value. Now, in the analog world, it means nothing. Okay. So when you, uh, so I had, I had him send me the consolidated file of that Trabone track. And I said, well, send it to me. Let me throw it through RX. And sure enough, when I pulled it in, oh my God, this, there was a huge difference. So I just hit fix <laughs> on RX and it changed it. It corrected it, you know, in milliseconds, really. And but it changed the full scale di digital value. It lowered it by five or six dB. And I said, "Wow!" And this is just the trombone track, exactly. At this point, the right? the the one uh, el element that was uh, di was distorting. Okay, so I sent it back to him. He put it back in the session. Ran the same automated mix, exact. Okay, and I ran it through the my exact chain, and it totally fix the problem. And there's where I learned the value of checking phase rotation, uh, whatever you want. There are a couple of different names for it. But if you see that in your waveforms, realize that if you're if if they're way out of balance, then what you're creating is a false digital value, which is going to reduce your digital headroom. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I when I brought brought this up and and uh, uh, made folks aware of it in one of the videos, one of the responses was, "Oh, great! So now we get to turn it up even louder." <laughs> oh, come on, God, dude! You know, no, that's not the point. The point yeah. was creating headroom so you can you work it. effectively. You know, and and so anyway, it's well, a let, great let me, tool. Let me um, say some of that back to you and see if I'm um, interpreting this correctly. Sure. In that situation, because it was a trombone solo, the trombone is trying to be up front in the track. So that headroom was really needed in that moment because it's a loud instrument. If exactly. that trombone was per perhaps buried in a horn section down lower in the mix, it might not have ever been an issue in the first place. Correct. Okay, so fair. So we don't necessarily need to now start phase correcting um, the rotation of every single track before we start mixing. <laughs> well, although I'd be curious it, what that it, would do. You see, if you think about it, you're if you're uh, if you start compiling all of these false values, right? Well, it's becomes that sounds like a description of my life. Philosophically. I know, I know, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <Luke. laughs> I'm just trying to get it right. I'm just trying to get my values right. <laughs> I never have. At any rate, um, if you if you are you know adding insult to injury, by the time you get down to your two mix bus, you've got a lot of false values. Well, your headroom is shot shot to hell. I'm not going to be able to do what I need to, need to do. So, you know, if you've got the time and the money, or uh, if you can just at least look at your files and be cognizant, if you see something that's just way out of whack, well, you've got the tool in uh, RX to fix it within seconds. Yeah, that's and, great. Well, you said it only took, yeah, seconds, milliseconds. So Milliseconds, I, I, yeah. I'm curious about it. Now, here's things that do come to mind. I think about, you know, we were talking about kick, we're talking about bass. Those are big energy factors in a mix that that are affecting our ability to bring that crest factor up on everything in mm -hmm. the final version. So it might do a lot there. Um, I think maybe if I'm, again, if I'm remembering that it was Dr. Ford that brought it up, it may have been in the context of, of hip hop stuff in 808. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those, again, I don't know how much 808 kick, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing John over there, but that would be an example of a genre where you would want to get it really, you know, loud and proud because you're trying to push that up to the limit. And so I could see maybe that being a place to check it out too. Absolutely. Yeah. We uh, see a lot of 808 and, and if the symmetry of uh, the waveform is uh, correct, then it's going to, we can get it, get it loud. But 
if there's a false value in there, uh, it's, we're going to have problems. So it's always a good idea to at least look at it and fix it. It's, it's so easy to fix. Now, I think in the and, video that you did, you actually just took the finished mix and then just took a selected across a section of it. Yeah, we do that too. It there too. Yeah, we'll uh, every mix that that uh, comes in, we will put it through RX uh, for that very reason. We check for phase rotation symmetry, whatever you want to call it, and if we can improve the full scale or let's say lower the full scale digital value of of uh, the mix, then we'll we'll do it. And bear in mind, this when you use that tool, it it does not affect at all the RMS value of the file. It does not affect the sonic, uh, the uh, timbre, timbre, wh- however you want to pronounce it. That's another one of those words. I'll ask my girlfriend. She always gets those right. <laughs> Thank you. Have her email me and tell me. But it does not change anything about the template of the sound. It just corrects the digital value. Okay, and that's what's important because we live in the digital world. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Good gracious! Do we really now live in the digital world? Has the metaverse already arrived? <laughs> <laughs> VR is oh, there, okay. man. So, yeah. Who knows? Are, yeah. Is that something? Um, I know that's a that's a real aside topic, but are you yeah. thinking about things like Atmos and immersive sound and virtual reality? And oh boy, you want to open, you want to open up that can of worms? <laughs> I know you did. You did preface this by saying, "Hey, man, I'm 71." You know. Well, so, this and I live in a stereo world, and and I have very strong opinions about Atmos and so forth. And I really, <laughs> I, I I don't really think I need to get into all that. That's I, fair, fair I, I, I am not going to invest in it because none of my client base has anywhere near the amount of money, number one, to spend on an Atmos mix. Mm-hmm. And number two, uh, to have to pay me to master it. And at, no, they, uh, no, all, only the one or two percenters have that kind of budget uh, and live in that kind of world. And frankly, I, uh, you know, you open the can of worms. I really yeah. don't, I really don't think that Atmos is going to be become a de facto standard for uh, the mass market. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it is incredible for the film and movie business um, and there are a lot of opinions about whether it's applicable to music. I think it is applicable to music if the music was originally written with Atmos in mind. That's, I'm 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 looking forward to hearing versions of that when it happens. Yeah, exactly. And I think from that standpoint, yeah, it is fun. It's awesome. It's it's a real experience. But God help you if you can't sit in the sweet spot, right? <laughs> you know, it's going back to your orchestral um, mm-hmm. story. It's it's sort of like saying if a piece was written for you know banjo and fiddle, um, is it <laughs> does it automatically translate to a full orchestra on the on the stage? You know, exactly. And you know, they they took some of the the mono uh, mixes from the Beatles. And uh, they uh, mix remix some of them in. Mm-hmm. Atmos, and they had some gold golden ears come in and sit down and listen. And they took a poll: which do you really prefer? And nine times out of ten, everybody preferred the mono mixes because they just felt right. Yeah. And when you start dissecting and 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 isolating all of these original elements that were originally intended to blend together and you're spitting them out on different sides of the room, they're not going to blend. They're just going to exist. Yeah. And so from a musical standpoint, that's not what the ori- what the original intent was. So if you, you know, at Atmos from a logistical standpoint is kind of tough for the home because you got to have speakers all over the place. Right. And these, and these bars that are supposed to shoot um, sounds up to the ceiling. Well, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, 
I love my the heat and smoke up here. <laughs> well, yeah, I love no, I my know. I love my surround system at home for yeah. uh, movies with a great sub, and I'm real happy with that. Yeah. So, well, um, you know, again, another another rewind. We talked about when when the bass player and the drummer understand the power of that kick and that bass, and what that how that translates out of a pair of speakers in an, in the final production, mm-hmm. it becomes a new a new form of comp- understanding the composition and and why you would make decisions, and you know the the mono to Atmos analogy. Really, I see the same thing. It's like when those records were made and there were mono mixes were intended they were you know the the vision for what kind of idea oh i got this idea for something is thinking about that mono speaker so it just makes sense i mean everything doesn't have to translate to everything else you know yeah and and they uh, arrange our mixes need to translate everywhere else because you master them so well that part does yeah yeah but but they they created those mono products uh in the arrangements and uh, nothing crowded anything else. Every, you could hear everything, yeah. right? Yeah. But it was mono. Well, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, when I'm in the studio and I think about a sound, I'm, I'm, my, my brain is imagining that sound coming out of the speakers. So it's like you're thinking forward, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to. You're not writing a kick drum part for the acoustic guitar. You're writing an acoustic no. guitar part for the acoustic guitar. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, the soundtrack to this podcast, in fact, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. These techniques would work for you no matter what DAW you're using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to practice your mixing and even include in your mix portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. All right. Um, so I have an, uh, another question. We're, we're coming up on the end here. But um, in situations where the rock stars are working with a mastering engineer and they're trying to, maybe they're, maybe they're trying some different people out. They're, you know, they're, it's, maybe it's a new experience. But what advice do you have for um, those of us who just want to know if the mastering engineer that we worked with has done a good job? Whether, whether what, we're, what we're getting back as a master is, is the right answer. Well, here's where sonic values come in, come into play. Um, If when you get your final mastered product back and you compare it to your original mix, if it, if the, um, oh, how do you, how do I say this? If you don't get a smile on your face, there's something wrong, right? Um, If I am unable to, enhance your original intention then i'm not doing my job and i've got to understand that's why i always have a a a, a nice conversation with the, the um the creator let's say mm-hmm. um before i start because i want to know well num- number one i ask who's your competition right who is this? Uh, wh- who is this file going to go up and com- compete with? Let's say these songs go into a playlist that's created on Spotify or you know whatever. <clears throat> is it going to stand up? Well, is it going to stand up artistically? Well, I don't have anything. I can't change the artistry, but I can enhance it. I can make sure that when it comes on the, the playlist, that sonically it matches up. Um, level wise, well, we're running into because of level 
uh, uh, management that's going on with all the streaming services, we don't necessarily have to worry about that as mm-hmm. much. But the sonic footprint has got to compete. So if um, if the creator of the original music has been keeping in mind uh, the rest of the world, the competition, if they are cognizant of the market, uh, that's the best way to go about it. And uh, as long as the conversation that I have with the original artists <clears throat> is, as long as they can tell me what their original intention was and whether they want it to be loud as crap or they want it to be dynamic and they want it to, comp- com- to compete with this song or that song, I can make that happen. But the mixer and the arranger recordists they've all got to do their their part uh in aligning themselves to that end result and if everybody is on the same page how can you lose well you lose if your music sucks you know <laughs> and you don't know how to how to write that's that's where rubber meets the road and we hear that you know there's yeah. a lot of crap out there now because I- we we <laughs> we don't necessarily have the gatekeepers that we had before. The the original gatekeepers were the record labels because nobody could afford to go into a professional studio, hire professional, you know, you know, spend the amount of money that was required to uh, re- record uh, an album. Well, uh, the record labels wouldn't put out crap. Well, now anybody can put out anything. Mm. For no money at all, save for a little bit of an investment in a, a black box a computer or, you know, whatever. Um, and so, there, therefore, there is a lot of crap music out in the world today. And you've got to be able to get through that forest. I don't know how some people do it, to be honest with you. There's, there's so much poop <laughs> uh, in music out there that you have to get around all that. So, yeah. well, hopefully if it's great, it just, it comes through that forest. It shines like a beacon in yeah. the trees in the darkness. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, uh, and uh, to go back, this is, a, again, this is a business, strictly yeah. a business. And just like if I was uh, in the business of manufacturing, let's say, a mechanical pencil, well, I would go out into the market, buy every mechanical pencil out there, bring it back to my shop, tear it apart, find out what was good and bad about each one, and make sure that mine had all the good components and could compete. Well, that analogy is exactly the same and is valid for the music business. It's simple. It's business, right? Be cognizant of the competition. That's great. That's great. I love it. Um, well, let me ask you this, uh, and then and then we'll roll out here. This is our closing question. It's the one we like to end with <laughs> on the podcast. I've asked you probably the same question before, but it's always fun to hear if there's a, a new answer. <laughs> Take the Wayback Studio Machine, and you go back and find um, young John... Who's, who's saying like, should I play bass with my fingers or play bass with my thumb? I don't know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and you say, listen, dude, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What yeah. advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Well, one of the things that, uh, in fact, one of the most important things that I was never taught coming up in the industry is the incredibly crucial important aspect of human relationships, uh, customer relationships, um, uh, making sure that your customer is happy, listening to them, responding to them, returning their calls. There was an instance when I first got hired uh, at um, a studio in uh, Dallas. I was back in Studio C, and one of my responsibilities was to transfer um, the uh, remote uh, audio recordings on from films from film sets from a Nagra to 16 millimeter mag, and nice. um, one of my uh, clients was one of the the uh, the big sound uh, recorders at that point in time there, and and uh, he called me one day. This was early on in my 
uh, career. He called and sec- the, I, I was busy in session. The secretary took took the message, and at the end of the day, she brought the message to me. And I put it down. I didn't return the call. So the next day, I came in for work, got busy. He calls again. Secretary takes down the note, brings it back to me. At the end end of the day, what do I do? I didn't call him because I had a party to go go to or you know whatever. And third day comes comes up, and who do, who do I see at my studio door was my boss. Boss says, John, you haven't called so and so back in two days. He wants to book a session, or has a question about you know a particular scene or or take or you know whatever. Why haven't you called him back? And I said, oh, geez, Christ. <laughs> well, my real answer should have been, I didn't learn to do that. I didn't learn. Nobody ever taught me the importance of customer relationships. Mm-hmm. After all, we are working with the human race. We are working with other humans. And it's incredibly important to make sure that your clients are, are taken care of. The, after all, they're paying your fee. Um, they're, they're putting the money out. Well, you damn well better have respect for that. And uh, so if I were to ever want to be able to go back and tell me something that John, please respect your customer and pay homage to them, take care of them, baby them, make sure they're happy. Yeah. Uh, That's incredibly important and so important to the success and extension of your career. It's all about that. Well, that's great advice. And I think about it in the modern age and I think about, you know, that text message or that email. Email is the worst for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that accompanying your suggestion is maybe reminding ourselves that it's not like we're it's not like we're intentionally being a dick or something. You know, no, just, not at you're all. Just, you're just busy. You get overwhelmed. You get exhausted. And it's just like, ah, I just can't handle that right now. And my reminder to myself is, because um, I, I always want to get back to people, is um, it's it's a lot of times it's better to just say, you know what, if, I, if I'm worried about typing a response on my phone because it's going to be too clunky with my big thumbs or something. Mm-hmm. It's like, just mm-hmm. take that, give myself a second, get on a good computer, give a fast reply to something. Even if it's like, let me get back to you with the answer to that. Something yeah. to make sure that people know you're uh, you're there for them and that they're, they're being heard because yeah. it's uh, crucial. Uh, getting back to just, you're right, with the, just a simple quick text or email, message received, I'll get back to you after I finish my day or you know, whatever. Uh, just making sure that uh, they know you're listening, you know? Yeah. And then as far as an email tip, um, <laughs> I always like the uh, the snooze feature in Gmail or <laughs> or the boomerang plugin, which will at least say, make sure this comes back to the top of my inbox, you know, tomorrow or in two days so that Ooh, I don't forget. I don't it. have that. I, I, I need to look into that. That's it's pretty great, good. It's pretty good. Like I said, the, the snooze feature is built in, but Boomerang, Boomerang. You can, it's a free plugin. I think it's still free, but you can send an email and then you can say, I sent that to them, but also send it back to me in two days so that I don't miss it myself. Because okay, I'm on it. I'll they get just that. disappear down that that list, you know. That'll help because we get so many emails every single day. It's insane. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, John, thanks so much for being on the show again, man. It's such a blast to hang with you, and I'm glad you think my my jokes are funny. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as you know, we from from my perspective, we've only sort of just uh, tickled the top of the mountain of of uh, info that I can pass along to folks. And uh, yeah. there's there's so many aspects of this business that we work in, the marriage between art and science. And believe me, it is a huge marriage between art and science. And marriage is hard enough to make, you know, work, but uh, it's got to happen. And yeah. there's, there's so much detail yeah. that needs to be addressed when you're working. Uh, well, no, you're, you're incredibly to attentive to that. And then Rockstar's reminder, um, on YouTube, John has 
created a great playlist of um, teaching videos with Adam Audio. And so I, I highly recommend you check those out as well, because you talk about like finding the little ticks and sounds and stuff. And, mm. and it's, you know, it's cool to listen to it and go like, oh, yeah, I hear that. Yeah, wow, that is better without it in there. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you can also find those uh, videos on our website, MayfieldMastering.com. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Under one of the men menu items. I don't, I don't recall which one videos maybe on, but you can find them there too. And so if the rock stars are ready to uh, get their next um, hit song and, and ground uh, platinum album mastered, mm -hmm. yeah. um, they should go to mayfieldmastering.com. Sure. And, and realize that, uh, and don't be afraid to, to send some, something because what, what uh, we do here is that for somebody that I've never worked for before, we'll, we offer a, a free mastering demo. Um, I'll take your file, and if I think it is ready for mastering, then I'll go ahead and master it. I'll send you 75% of it. You know, there's there's no money involved here. So I'll send you 75% of it. And But it kills two birds with one stone. It'll allow me to analyze your mix and make any suggestions that I think might improve the product. Um, and then at the same time, it'll sh if I think it's ready, for mastering, then I'll do it and send it to you, and that'll give you an idea, uh, a exact idea of what my take in mastering would be on your particular file. So we're killing two birds with one stone. We're getting to know one another, and if you like what I do, then we'll master the product for you. Fantastic. So, yeah. It's and easy. And Rockstars, uh, again, we've got a playlist in the show notes, too, if you just want to quickly listen to some of these amazing sounding records. Because, John, I noticed immediately, I mean, you were showing on a on a video, you were sort of, you were showing the difference between unmastered and mastered. And mm -hmm. and it was like, it just sounded so much better. <laughs> so. Well, yeah. And, and also realize in that playlist, there are uh, a number of uh, some of the remastered high res files that we did for Universal back in the day, uh, but they were mandated at being at minus four, 14 lus. So they are quite a, a bit lower in level. So uh, realize that there are some in there that are really low in, in level, but that is completely intentional. And that's a whole nother <laughs> can of worms to uh, get into at some other time. So even even if they play back on Spotify, for example, will will Spotify will maybe that's the target or something, but they yeah. they'll still sound maybe a little bit lower than others. No, because of loudness management, mm. right? That's going on with all the streaming services. What the streaming services are trying to accomplish is to get a zero, well, a, a common overall level, regardless of genre, coming out of the output of their their system. So yeah. they, they want everything to sound the same. So if you send something in bust ass loud, they're going to drop it down three, five, six dB, whatever. Uh, and, and unfortunately, all the services are not using the same lust standard. It's just frustrating. They're all trying to figure, figure this thing out. But they should just at, call you. At, le <laughs> at least they're trying to do something about this damn loudness war that we've been living with for so long. It's been so frustrating. They've ruined music for so much. Uh, time. So um, uh, uh, the loudness management thing is starting to help. Now uh, we're in the loudness, the loudness detente. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're, we're getting there and music is starting to sound a little bit better because we don't have to master crazy ass loud unless it needs to be, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. all I can say is it's an exciting time to be making music because we have incredible tools. We've got incredible resources. We're lucky enough to get to hang out with, um, you, you know, people like yourself for mm. <laughs> two hours at a time and just talk about this stuff. And it's, I just yeah. feel like the, the, the greatness of music and sound in our studios is right at our fingertips like never before. And, you know, to me, from my perspective, having been in the business for, uh, well, since I picked up my first guitar, 58 years ago, it's always been ex an exciting time to be in music. I've always loved being in this business because it's, I don't know, it, 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 it just does something to my psyche that, that nothing else can. That's awesome. That's <laughs> A lot awesome. of times I tell, tell folks it's, uh, 
the most fun you're going to have with your clothes on, you know? <laughs> well, John, <laughs> we appreciate you coming back on the show. That's a good, great note to close out on. And rock stars, thank you for listening. I, I look forward to seeing you around the studio soon, John. You bet. I look forward to it, Lich. All right, man. Cheers. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make great music. Hey, rock stars. I want to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Adam Audio, Isotope, Spectra 1964, and Sampley. Plus, remember to use these coupon codes for special discounts. At isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. At jzmic.com, use the code ROCKSTAR for 40% off the V V47, V67, or V12 microphones. Plus, get a free shock mount worth $120. And at Sampley.app, use the coupon code RSR20 for 20% off. And at RecordingStudioRockstars.com slash Academy, use the coupon ROCKSTAR for 10% off. If you enjoy Recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the link in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things that I use in my own studio, and I highly recommend them for your studio as well. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I want to also thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko and Braden Streming for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.